You're listening to Medscape's In Discussion series on cardiorenal metabolic syndrome, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Nihar Desai. Dr. Desai is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Vice Chief of the Section of Cardiovascular Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. Relevant disclosures can be found with the episode show notes on Medscape.com or the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for use healthcare professionals. Hello, I'm Dr. Nihar Desai from the Yale School of Medicine. Welcome again to season one of the Medscape In Discussion Cardiorenometabolic Syndrome podcast series. Today, we're discussing novel therapies in cardiorenometabolic syndrome focusing in on the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and potassium binders. I'm absolutely delighted to have two expert guests joining us, Drs. Andrew Sauer and Dr. Matthew Sparks, for this roundtable discussion. Dr. Sauer is a cardiologist, associate professor, and clinical trialist at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute and the University of Missouri-Kansas City uh, Medical Center. Dr. Sparks is a nephrologist, associate professor, and program director for the Nephrology Fellowship Program at the Duke University School of Medicine. I would also point out to our listeners that he's the host of the Medscape In Discussion Chronic Kidney Disease Podcast, and I would highly encourage our listeners to check his incredible podcast out as well. So, Andrew and Matthew, thank you again, and welcome to the podcast discussion. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, great. I'm incredibly excited to have, you know, this discussion with the two of you. And we've been talking broadly about cardiorenometabolic. And of course, with the two of you, I really want to focus in on the kidney or the reno part of the cardiorenometabolic syndrome. And so, Dr. Sparks, I might ask you to, you know, kind of start us off and maybe speak to how things across these three systems or these three domains, the cardio, the reno, and the metabolic are so interrelated. And then if we focus in on the reno or the kidney part of that, what do we know about epidemiology, prevalence, pathobiology? Maybe let's just start off there for our listeners. Well, thank you for highlighting the kidney. And that's what's really exciting about this is rejuvenation of recognizing that chronic kidney disease is really a manifestation of cardiovascular disease. Everything is sort of linked there together and having this out there is really important. CKD definitions have been evolving over time, and I like to sort of think about it in two eras, the EGFR-centric era of CKD, where everyone is sort of divided in what their GFR is. Um, so stage one, two, three, four, and five, five being on dialysis, and a gradation from one to five. However, that doesn't really tell us the whole story, and if you look at risk of progression to kidney failure, which is almost analogous to risk of getting worse and worse cardiovascular disease in which heart failure is in that spectrum as well. You can look at someone's urinary albumin to creatinine as a really good marker of progression. So two individuals with identical GFRs will have very, very different risk of cardiovascular disease and kidney failure depending on what those values are. So I think now where we were in the EGFR era, we're now in the EGFR plus urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. And now we're able to define that by equations like the kidney failure risk equation. So the reason why I say that is you look at the prevalence and a lot of that is defined by EGFR. It's stated in the literature about 14% of all adults have kidney disease. However, some of that is likely just aging. And so you have to dig a little bit deeper. And if you look at just UACRs or urinary albumin to creatinine ratio, normal is defined as less than 30 milligrams per gram. There's about 10% of patients that basically have a UACR greater than that. If you look at the intersection between cardiovascular disease and CKD, you'll look at and say about... 63% of patients with CKD have cardiovascular disease. And, and that is like seeing cardiovascular disease, heart attack, heart failure. But many of these individuals just, you don't know for sure it's subclinical. 
if you look at heart failure, about 60% of patients with heart failure have kidney disease. And, it, and so that's really important um, to know that as well. So it's highly prevalent. It makes it very challenging, which we'll talk about more, especially with alterations in GFR from starting patients on goal-directed medical therapy. And also we'll get into the weeds on potassium. So Dr. Sauer, as a cardiologist and obviously as a heart failure specialist, you certainly see many, many patients with CKD, just like Matt just outlined. I want to step back and maybe double click a little bit on what he talked about, this kind of notion of screening using EGFR, but also using the UACR. So I might ask you to, to tell our listeners a little bit about some of the newer recommendations that are out there for screening, the new heat map that might facilitate risk stratification for CKD, and then maybe what the role is of the non-nephrologist in this kind of screening and identification of the patient with CKD? What role does the internist, the cardiologist, the family practitioner have that this is not the work of just a nephrologist alone, but all of us have a role to play in that? I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks for that. And I think that the disease burden is so vast and so heavy. It's worth noting that the American Heart Association finally gave recognition to this and, and essentially identified cardio kidney metabolic disease as an important mandate that all of us who take care of these patients are really responsible for addressing. And I thought Dr. Sparks' introduction to this was really important. And I like your term about double clicking because as he's describing sort of this era of the GFR focused kidney assessment, I would say that for most cardiovascular practitioners, we're still sort of stuck in that era, which is not right. And we need to move into the the different ways of assessing kidney disease. And there's obviously the five stages of GFR, which we are traditionally pretty good at focusing on, but there's also the three stages of urine albumin creatinine ratio. And when you put these in a heat map, as you point out, the Kadigo approach, which has been around for over a decade, by the way, we can really put risk together and also identify potential patients who might be candidates for some novel therapies, which we'll talk more about. But for example, when you look at the albumin, urine albumin creatinine ratio categories, we're talking about essentially less than 30. And then we have the microalbuminuria category of 30 to 300, essentially. And then the macroalbuminuria category of greater than 300. And this is really important for cardiologists to identify how to risk stratify these patients, because we know that as you progress in the GFR stage uh, of kidney disease and, and simultaneously progress in the UACR stages, the incidence and prevalence of these combined diseases, including most notably cardiovascular disease and heart failure, goes up quite precipitously. And just to put this in perspective, when you take patients with more advanced chronic kidney disease as assessed by you know, essentially stage three UACR plus stage four, five GFR, you're talking about an incidence of heart failure over five years of 20% when patients are previously asymptomatic. We've also seen that there's a strong correlation between levels of UACR and preclinical markers of congestion and structural changes on echocardiography and other imaging modalities. So I think that we need to be building UACR assessment kind of take home point into our workflows of assessing risk and predicting risk for our patients. And I don't think that's really happening in a lot of practices. I've only started recently doing this in the last couple of years as I've been focused on more devoted attention to cardio kidney metabolic disease. Yeah, Andrew, thank you. And I think you know both of you guys rightfully pointed out that the sense of urgency that we all have to have as kind of a clinical care team, all of us as practitioners that are touching these patients and caring for them, that I think this idea of you know using EGFR but also using UACR. And, and being activated to, you know, check it, to send it, and then to integrate it into our decision-making is a really critical point. Maybe with that as a backdrop, let's get into some of the newer therapies. There's actually been a lot of new therapies coming in this space. I will say for the audience, we've already had dedicated episodes on SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. And so I would encourage you to check those out as well. With Matt and Andrew, I want to focus mostly on the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and of course, the potassium binders. So Dr. Sparks, can you give our listeners a quick overview of potassium binders and then how you are using these in your clinical practice? 
Well, thanks for that. Yeah, so potassium binders has really been a game changer for nephrologists because we see hyperkalemia all the time. And when I was in training, all we had was sodium polystyrene sulfonate or KXLate, which really didn't have a lot of data surrounding it. And so it's really also a, a, a great thing right now is we have randomized controlled trials. We have two agents that are currently available right now. One is called sodium zircodium cyclosilicate, otherwise known as Lokelma. This is also known as ZS9 because it apparently has nine times the affinity for potassium than KXLate does. And then the second agent is Petirimer or Valtessa. These both work in the gut to bind potassium and to excrete the potassium into your stool. They work both differently. The sodium zirconium cyclosilicate works by an exchange for sodium. Its onset of action is a little bit faster, about one hour, and it, it actually works in the entire GI tract, including the colon and the small bowel. There are a few things you have to worry about. One is edema. However, this is not really borne out in clinical medicine. There's a potential of that exchange for sodium that people were concerned about, but in, I have not seen that in my clinical practice, nor has it really been that evident in, in the studies. You also need to be concerned about when patients take their medications, because these can also bind to medications, so they should take it a few hours after eating medications. The second drug called Petirimer, onset of action is a little bit longer, within a one to seven hour range. Now it only works in the colon, so you, the patient needs to have a functional colon for this to work. This drug works by exchange of calcium for the potassium um, that's in the colon. It can also sometimes pick up magnesium and you can have hypomagnesemia, so that's something to look out for. And again, you can have drug interference. There are many studies with both of these drugs and we're gonna talk about a few of them. However, a lot of this is dictated by what insurers have as preferences for your patients. So you need to ensure that you talk, you know, when you order the med, you'll sort of know which one they can or can't take based on their insurance provider. Thanks so much. That was a terrific overview. And, you know, it sounds like we've got two new options and, you know, they are certainly being used in your clinical practice and payer considerations, you know, weigh on that as well. But it's nice to hear about some of the evidence that's out there. I want to get to Dr. Sauer now and, and Andrew, maybe talk to us about some of the kind of cardiovascular outcomes trials, or maybe some of the larger trials that have been done with both Petirimer and the Diamond trial, and maybe some very new evidence that's going to come out about the SEZ compound as well. The most well-known potassium binder, at least in the heart failure space, that's also most commonly used, although not all that common in the U.S., would still be Petirimer. The Diamond study, as it relates to Petirimer, was initially built on the hypothesis that we could improve adherence and maintenance of optimal guideline-based medical therapies, specifically the RASI space, so the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone inhibitors, and we could maximize the adherence to those therapies, which we know are what's best for patients and their overall outcomes, by using potassium binders. This, like many studies at the time, was significantly confounded and impacted by COVID-19 this ultimately led to some changing before the study was complete, changing of the primary endpoints so that the study didn't have to be abandoned because enrollment was very challenged. I think it was good because they salvaged the study to allow us to learn some things about how Petiramir may be used and, and to help patients. There's a couple lessons from this. I mean, they ultimately randomized nearly a thousand patients who had a history of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as well as hyperkalemia or history of hyperkalemia, patients had to go through a really important run-in stage, which was actually quite lengthy. And one of the lessons learned in Diamond, which we also learned ultimately in Realize K, which is SCZ coming later, is that most of the patients, when initiated and challenged with RASI, and in particular with up titration of MRA to target dose, for example, spironolactone 50 milligrams, guess what? Most patients actually can tolerate that pretty well. And so this fear of hyperkalemia with RASI and MRA tends to be overblown. And we've now seen that borne out to be true in two big trials, uh, one that's been presented, the Diamond Study, and another one, Realize K, that's coming. Ultimately, though, Petiramir did show a reduction in hyperkalemic events uh, defined as a potassium over 5.5, also had improved trajectory of patient care, being able to maintain on an MRA at target dose. 
and total number of hyperkalemic events were also reduced in those randomized to the pteromere potassium binders. We also saw that patients had a better likelihood of having improved medication use, specifically the RASI use score, which was built into a win ratio approach for assessing the, the uh, secondary endpoints. Ultimately, we should see the potassium binders as an important tool in our toolbox to, to mitigate the risk of hyperkalemia. There are other strategies to mitigate risk for hyperkalemia, such as including SGLT2 inhibitors in the regimen, for example, has been shown in a number of observational studies and clinical trials to be likely associated with mitigated risk for hyperkalemia. We are still seeing a pretty slow uptake in the U.S. in particular of using potassium binders to optimize GDMT, and that has been somewhat disappointing. Yeah, it's, it's a critical point. I mean, I think we've heard and, and spoken about the underuse of evidence-based therapies amongst patients with CKD and obviously in the heart failure space and maybe even more broadly, patients with cardiovascular disease, really that sort of CRM or CKM patient. The underuse of MRAs, again, something that you know has been written about for decades. And in that context, we also have a new therapy available. And so we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit away from the potassium binders now. I think it's all interrelated, but I want to get into the MRA space a little bit more and talk about finerenone, a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So Dr. Sparks, what do we know about finerenone from an efficacy and safety standpoint? What do you find most important about the evidence that's currently available? Again, how are you using this in your practice? Finerenone and the Fidelio trial and the Figaro trial were really important in the kidney space. In my view, it ushered in the relevance of MRAs in CKD in general. It is also important to note right now, the studies were done in patients with diabetes and kidney disease. And I'm speaking about the Fidelio randomized clinical trial. And so this was a randomized clinical trial that looked at individuals that were on optimal um, RAS blockade. Importantly, they had a run-in period that was active where they actually pushed the dose of either an ACE or an ARB to the maximal labeled dose. If they had hyperkalemia during that, they were excluded from the actual uh, randomized clinical trial. And then they were randomized either finerenone or placebo. And so the primary outcome, which was a composite, a kidney failure composite with also sustained greater than 40% reduction EGFR and death, uh, was positive at a hazard ratio of 0 0.82. This was a really important study that really showed that blocking the mineralocorticoid receptor is important in patients with kidney disease. However, I'll also have to point out to our listeners that, as we've already mentioned, we have other mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, namely spironolactone and aplerinone. And, and the issue with those is that we don't really have any good long-term studies. We do have one that's about a year in length, but we know from SGLT2 inhibitor data, from MRA data, that you really don't see the difference really start to emerge until after about a year. And we have data shows that spironolactone, aplerinone, both reduced albuminuria, which we talked about is an important a surrogate outcome to predict risk. Finerenone, I think, was really a well-crafted drug in that they picked a dose that was low enough that it had a low, I'm not going to call it side effect, because really, as I mentioned earlier, hyperkalemia is a physiologic effect of these drugs is lower because hyperkalemia does did occur in this study at a higher frequency in finerenone, but it's only at 2.3% that led to discontinuation versus about 0.1% in the controls. Now we have another agent, which is finerenone, but also I think in patients that are unable to access this drug, we should be using fernalactone or we also should be going for plerinone. And we also have the addition of potassium binders to help in that. We're going to see more. I mean, this is just the beginning. The underuse of this class of medicines is something, again, that we've, we've spoken about for so long. I really hope that maybe at this moment, we'll all take the charge to really apply the evidence and implement these highly effective therapies, including finerenone, and then some of the alternatives, the spironolactone and the aplerinone, as, as you kind of talked about as well. And so I want to turn to Andrew because he is involved in two very interesting 
evidence generation programs for finerenone. So Andrew, I might ask you to tell us about the two kind of programs that you're involved in for finerenone. First is the CareHK, the registry program, and then similarly, a very large clinical trial program in the heart failure space. And so maybe you can kind of take us and our listeners through that in sequence. I'll speak to maybe CareHK first. I can say less about that because some of what we can talk about is under embargo right now. But the reality is we, we do need real world evidence of how clinicians are caring for patients at risk for hyperkalemia, particularly when using evidence-based therapies, including RASI. And so CareHK was designed to really understand that population better because we don't really have great registry data. CHAMP-HF, for example, was a registry it allowed us to learn about real-world use of guideline-based medical therapies, but it really was not enriched with patients who were at risk for hyperkalemia or had advanced kidney disease. In fact, I think only about 20% of patients in CHAMP-HF really fell within that realm. CARE-HK exclusively looks at patients who have to be on RASI plus be a candidate for or on MRA who are at risk for hyperkalemia, defined as a history of hyperkalemia or other risk factors such as reduced GFR, for example. So it's very much a true high-risk population. We've already kind of presented and published some of the baseline uh, characteristics, and notably, GDMT, you know, guideline-based medical therapies and RASI use was obviously high because you had to be on some dose of RASI at the outset, but we'll be presenting the results of the CARE-HK registry at the Heart Fair Society meeting in September with ideally a simultaneous publication going into all the primary endpoints. But one of the things we hope to show is how much hyperkalemia is there really in a high-risk population? And what do clinicians do with hyperkalemia? Do they up titrate or downtrate uh, various medications? Do they use potassium binders? And then this was a registry that involved essentially just Europe and North America, US. And so we'll get to see some dis discrepancies between how practice patterns roll out in Europe versus the US. And then moving into um, finerenone as it relates to the clinical trial program, it was recently announced by Bayer that the fine art study will be presented by Scott Solomon's group uh, at the ESC meeting in London. And we're all very excited about it because the top line results suggest that finerenone, as used in patients with mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction heart failure in a 6,001 patient study, appears to hit the primary endpoint. We don't have more details than that yet, but we're all enthusiastic to see what's in those details. But the other thing I'll just say is that we have an entire program following on in fine arts uh, with three additional trials, all called part of the larger Moonraker program, looking at finerenone in three additional studies uh, of patients with heart failure, particularly at increased risk of cardio kidney metabolic disease as well. Uh, Redefine HF is the first one, and that's going to be looking at a very similar population of fine arts, but exclusively at the hospitalized point in time. So similar to what we did with Impulse and looking at SGLT2 inhibitors, looking exclusively at patients admitted with heart failure, but with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction. The second one will be confirmation, which is kind of a similar study designed to strong HF. It's an open label study, sort of an implementation study, looking at um, the use of early initiation finerone plus SGLT2 inhibitor, in this case, epiglifloxin versus so-called usual care. And that'll be a six-month follow-up study focusing on a win-ratio approach, hierarchical endpoints, uh, including heart outcomes, as well as um, uh, health status measured by KCCQ. And the last of the program is a kind of return to the past. Now we're going to be looking at finality HF, which will be looking at patients who have a indication for MRA because they have reduced ejection fraction, but they're either intolerant or unsuitable uh, for traditional steroidal MRA. And so this will be patients who will be randomized to finerenone versus placebo, but it'll essentially be the next sort of rails or uh, um, emphasis HF type study, but focused on finerenone and going back to the reduced ejection fraction cohort. So these will all be uh, enrolling for the next several years, and I hopefully we'll have a report out on all three of these in addition to what we're going to hear from Fine Arts uh, this year in the next three to four years. And so there's a huge pipeline coming on the backs of the success and the lessons learned of the Fidelio and, and Figaro studies, which of course led to the hypothesis of reduced incident heart failure 
So why shouldn't this medication class also be a treatment for patients with heart flare and particularly for those with cardio kidney metabolic disease? We've covered a lot of ground here. Matt and Andrew, thank you again. I, you know, we kind of talked a lot about epidemiology, screening, the importance of integrating UACR with EGFR, and then getting back to some of the real essentials in terms of evidence-based therapies, how to integrate potassium binders into our clinical practices, both from a nephrology perspective, but also maybe a cardiology perspective. And then lots of excitement also about MRAs. Yes, spironolactone and oplerinone and kind of applying those and hopefully reinvigorating our use of those, but also phenerinone as a non-steroidal MRA in kind of thinking about how that might fit in to our clinical practice as well. And so with that, I really just want to thank you again, Andrew and Matt, for joining me on this podcast discussion. I'll also say to our audience, please take a moment to download the Medscape app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is Nihar Desai from the Yale School of Medicine for the Medscape in Discussion Cardiorenal Metabolic Syndrome podcast series. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Cardiorenal Metabolic Syndrome podcast series with our host, Dr. Nihar Desai. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes, links, and more information on cardiorenal metabolic syndrome.